Well, hello. Welcome to this episode of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. I'm Trevor Page. Thanks for joining us. We have so much to talk about oh, since man. the last episode. <laughs> There's been lots of stuff. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed the Fully Charged Live uh, video that we put out last week. That was, again, a great event. And it yeah. was my pleasure to go to the UK. And a shout out to all the UK buddies out there. Um, yeah, again, it just exceeded my expectations. And uh, stay tuned, folks. Uh, Fully Charged is looking to do more stuff. They've already announced a, a three-day event for next year. Awesome. And uh, stay tuned for maybe for more stuff. Oh, I'd like to attend so, that maybe. Wait, so, yeah. So I've never been to the UK, so it'd be Well, we got to get you out for sure. <laughs> Drive on the other side of the road there. It's fun. <laughs> All right, let's get into some EV news. We've got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we like to start off the segments by uh, telling folks what's going on in the whole world of the EV revolution and, of course, global numbers and things like this. So there's a new report by the International Energy Agency uh, that talks about the adoption tripling in the next two years from an electric vehicle perspective, which is massive. And, you know, I think we've been talking about this since day one, Trevor, this hockey stick that we're seeing. Oh, it's already it's happening. It's happening. And you, you see these kind of reports come out now monthly and, and, and almost weekly about the stats. And right now in 2017, actually, there were more than 1 million plugins sold. And this, these are global numbers. Um, the total global fleet exceeded 3 million, which was up 54% from 2016. So again, that hockey stick momentum. Of course, where's the largest plug-in market, do you think? Uh, China. Absolutely correct. China, <laughs> which we don't talk a lot about, but they're going gangbusters. Uh, so the growth's not limited to cars. Of course, we now, you, you've put, we've both posted some stuff about the, the buses and transit systems, uh, even locally. Toronto's looking at it, Brampton. A yep. bunch of transit uh, companies are, are looking to adopt uh, fully electric buses. And also trucking, of course, Tesla Semi. Um, Mercedes. Mercedes now. Um, Volvo, I think is yeah. building uh, and the Nikola uh, one of course the Nikola one yeah so all these markets are growing and the report um, is estimating that by 2030 the plug-in car market the car market could reach 125 to 220 million and we're at 3 million now so that's a huge huge growth in real yeah. a relatively short amount of time yeah. So kind of like the tech boom thing. Well, the, you know, the tipping point has arrived at the manufacturing side. You mm -hmm. know, uh, the problem is, of course, and I've been talking to people a lot about this, is that in people's minds it hasn't arrived because you can't just walk into a car show room and, and see 15 cars that are all electric. Right now it might be one. Might be two, might Unless be zero. Unless you have a plug and drive near you, but that's the other story. Well, that's a different animal yeah. altogether. Right. But in, in the next two years, because this, this 2020, you know, number mm -hmm. that everybody puts out, that's yep. when you're actually going to see it. Like people walk in and go, oh my God, these things aren't unicorns. I can actually buy one, right? That's it, so, exactly. Yeah, you watch. And you're absolutely right. So, And part of the, the uh, adoption drivers are falling battery costs. Of course, they continue to get leaner, meter, and cheaper. Uh, there's still, in most places, strong government policies and incentives. Yep. Of course, we know in the U.S. things are back and forth, and here in Ontario, things are not looking that great, but we'll see. Um, of course, as you said, more products, more selection, uh, the more and more vehicles coming out, and the growing charging infrastructure. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about infrastructure on today's show. We've got a few stats to update you on there. So it's all positive. Um, and I think there's one country that's, you know, we know that the Netherlands has been leading, you know, Norway, the Netherlands, Scandinavian countries have been leading EV adoption. And it's great to see that uh, some of those countries are taking taking that a step further by starting education at a young, uh, educating the young. I love this And this, this is uh, in the Dutch school system. There's a re an article that came out that um, they, they've installed uh, modified EV box charging stations in playgrounds for these schools so that the kids actually practice, you know, plugging in their, their fake electric car or electric bike or whatever they have. They, um, there's a picture here that shows uh, one of the examples. But it's really teaching kids how charging works because, I mean, they're the ones that are going to grow up, you know, kind of like the millennials and children now that grew up with, you know, uh, keyless, keyboard, uh, less technology, you know, swipe and touch technologies. Yeah. EVs will just be a normal thing kids get this i was at a car show this past weekend right, and yeah. there were some young children there and you know the parents were talking about electric cars and i said your kids when they get to be the age to buy a car uh, they will have choices mm -hmm. and they will just grow up around this stuff much like uh you know our kids are growing up and they have computers and they have ipads and those kind of things that we didn't have as kids but they just take it for granted so electric vehicles are going to be the same way in a few years for these kids 100 percent agree yeah. and this is part of the dutch school system for education on sustainable living it's part of their framework and uh, i mean hopefully so there's some teachers out there watching the show this may be an initiative that you may want to lead in your school system or school itself so uh, have a have a think about it i'm sure there are partners um whether it's the ev ev charging infrastructure partners or state or local incentives that might help fund something like that it's a pretty 
cost effective. There's not a whole lot that, that they're spending on. Maybe that, even so. carpentry, like a like a high school or something yeah. could probably make some fake ones. And, yeah. Anyways, pretty Absolutely. good opportunity. Great idea. Yeah. So, I mean, you talked about kids that'll grow up and that uh, will experience the EV uh, momentum in much more, you know, in their lifestyle. There's some polls that are always going on to see how the minds are shifting towards EV adoption. And there's a new poll from a company called HPI. They're based in the UK. They did a study to look at those who would consider the change. And I believe they uh, polled over a thousand people on this survey. And they see that there is a big paradigm shift in consumer attitudes towards zero emission vehicles. And I mentioned in, in the fully charged live segment that UK is really kind of ahead of the curve, um, uh, especially over Canada from an EV adoption. The survey showed that 91% of millennials, uh, which I just missed out on that one, no. No, you didn't. <laughs> uh, are most likely to adopt an EV. And just 32% uh, of people aged 55 to 64 are, are looking to adopt it. So obviously, it's the younger generation that's seeing that bright future. Um, they also revealed that some of the, the reasons why consumers are concerned about EVs are things that we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. There's not enough charging points. The price of EVs is too high. It takes a long time to charge. Um, you know, battery life uh, stinks and it's going to it's going to fail yeah. over a short time. These are all misconceptions. So, uh, uh, you know, obviously continued education and public outreach is needed to, to further uh, EV adoption. And that's kind of why we do what we do going out. And we've got a segment coming up in the show about our, the Georgian College when we were at Georgian College a couple of weeks ago for a car show. You mentioned another car show you're at. And this is the kind of things that we do to go out and educate people. Right? You, 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 do, you go to EVS meetings and you're out there. Constantly talking to people. <laughs> yeah. He's so busy now, I don't even see him very much. I don't even know how I make him li how living you, in the meantime. <laughs> how do you get through the day? All right, so another area that we're seeing um, EV adoption potentially being forced is with uh, countries and uh, even cities now, municipalities, looking to ban diesels. And we've talked about this in past shows, about initiatives where countries are going to ban the sale, sale of diesel or even ICE cars in the future. Well, uh, the city of Milan in Italy has has taken a step further, and, and I think that this is really going to cause a ripple effect um, within that type of uh, mindset for municipalities. They've actually launched a progressive ban on diesel cars, which will start in 20, January of 2019, and it's going to be staged, and it's going to start focusing on older diesel cars, and they have this rating system, uh, like Euro 1, Euro 2, or something like okay. that, how they rate the diesels. They'll start on older cars uh, and then move to newer ones over time. Um, now, that's pretty significant because Italy has over 55% uh, market share of their vehicles are diesels. That's a lot of cars. Um, and Milan has a really strong history of environmental policies. Obviously, it's, it's a very historic uh, city. Uh, and they've implemented things uh, like London in the UK has done, things like the congestion charge uh, to kind of keep traffic down because of all the, the smog buildup. So this new ban is going to include... Um, the whole city, not just the historical uh, town center, and what they've done to enforce it. And you were asking me just before we started the show, is they're, they're, they've built a ring of 180 cameras around all the entrances to the city, all the different streets. And it'll be, uh, you know, kind of like a photo radar thing. They'll yeah. snap a picture and send you a fine if, you, if you're coming in there uh, from that perspective. So it's really going to obviously force people to spur EV adoption in that city and in that area. And uh, I think we'll see a lot more cities and towns follow. Yeah, I think probably what's going to happen is that maybe some of the manufacturers will probably increase their production of like the last mile type of trucks to do deliveries like EVs. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to ban the... Um, uh, the diesels in the city center, you got to, I mean, shipping is all done by trucks, essentially, these, these days, right? So you got to get them in and out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, looking forward to that. See what, see what but happens. But I hope they do it cautiously because yep. you're going to upset a lot of people if you don't do it right. And you don't want to upset the Italians. That's for <laughs> sure. We love them. We love them. Keep sending us emails. Uh, again, further adoption by government standards. Here we have in Canada, British Columbia is looking to implement a, uh, a zero emission vehicle mandate. Uh, for those who uh, don't know what that is, I mean, California was one of the ones that started that. In a Quebec has one states. too. And of course, here in Canada, Quebec is the first province to initiate a ZEV mandate. Um, and it's really to to help spur BC's climate change uh, strategy um, moving forward. And it's crucial for their reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they target about 40% f through household emissions uh, that they want to reduce over time. And the transportation sector being the biggest area to affect those re reductions. Um, as you mentioned, Quebec's the only other Canadian province to do that. And uh, they, they started it at the beginning of this year, mm -hmm. ZEV mandates. 
And this really adds again to California and 10 other US states that also have these mandates in place. Now the mandates really, how they work is they, um, they set escalating annual quotas on the manufacturers for battery electric or plug-in hybrid type vehicles, anything with a plug. And now of course, hydrogen fuel cell is in the mix there because that's, that's a technology that's growing, but slowly my understanding a lot, a lot more slower <laughs> we have than that. we have our own opinions about we that, have our but... own opinions <laughs> uh, i think commercial hydrogen is great yeah there's a case Consumer, to make for commercial but for, for passenger sure. vehicles it's just not going to happen so. i don't think it's going to happen i agree uh and of course if these manufacturers fall short in the quotas then they have to buy these expensive credits to make up the difference and that's where we've you've been talking about you know tesla selling their credits and things like that for others to uh because they're falling short well, there's only so many to go around, right? Mm -hmm. So they buy them from Tesla. Anyways, mm -hmm. that's a discussion that's for another, another discussion, day. But, uh, but anyway, good to see on BC. Hopefully that, that legislation passes and uh, they become a ZEV uh, province, the second one in Canada. Good. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, continuing on charging updates now, as we talked about earlier in the show, uh, Chatamo has just come out with a new protocol, the Chatamo 2.0. And what it's going to do, it's, it's kind of bringing up that protocol to newer standards because CCS and a lot of others, of course, are looking at ultra rapid charging yes, now. So yeah. it's going to bring it up to 400 kilowatts of charging. And uh, the good thing about it, it's still going to use the same connector shape as the current Chatamo uh, plug does. However, they'll implement liquid cooling uh, cables. And they have to. Like that. Uh, they have to. The heat's got to be. You Otherwise, you got to wear these big of, of glove mitts, you know, to take the connector out of like the car. Like an anti-radiation suit or something, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so, and again, future um, Chatamo charge points will still be able to charge the existing EV, so it'll be backwards compatible, which is good. Yeah. And uh, th it really brings it up to the standard that CCS is kind of leading the way on. And we know Tesla's working on an ultra rapid uh, ultra supercharging some kind of upgrade like to the that. supercharging system is that, there what 140 now or something like that 120, uh, yeah well, 125 but, it, but they're hoping to scale up they did mention something like uh, 200 or 225 yeah. okay um, you know, they, they seem to think that there's a sweet spot. There's, mm -hmm. they don't seem to think that there's a need to go to 400. They right. seem to think that there's a sweet spot around the 20, you know, 150 to 200. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. I think once we see, I mean, look at the you know, model three long range, um, 500 kilometers. I mean, that's pretty well full tank of, of fuel in, in a compact The, the model three charges car. like a beast. Yeah. Um, yeah. it really supercharges yeah. fast. And that's a combination of chemistry in the cells in the mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the, you know, the packs will have to see some kind of upgrade. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see. I mean, Tesla said yeah. sometime by the end of this year, we'll see some kind yeah. of upgrade. But I agree with your, your statement that when you start, you know, there may not be a need to kind of go beyond that. And once you start seeing five, 600 kilometer ranges and being able to charge under an hour to, to get that, or, you know, 45 minutes, half an hour, is there a need to go faster? You know, probably not. Well, I mean, the, the thing you have to remember yeah. about fast DC charging is that 90 plus percent of that is really for long distance charging, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know as yep. well as I do, you charge at home. So yep. you get up every day, you get a full charge. Mm -hmm. Do you need a supercharger? No, not for daily driving. It's only when you want to go on those long trips. Mm -hmm. So if you can make the behavior, and this is something that I've experienced in my car, if your charging distance is such that it's almost indistinguishable from a gas car, because eventually you got to stop and you got to go to the washroom, you got to get something to eat uh, or whatever else yeah, you more, need to do. As I mentioned, more bladder anxiety well, than range anxiety. Like, <laughs> exactly. So... Yeah. You know, if if that behavior is almost indistinguishable from a gas car, do you really need it to charge in five minutes? Yeah, there's edge cases where you need to do that, mm -hmm. but I don't think globally it needs to be like that all the time. Right. But but it's it's going to happen whether we like it or not. It's just because the technology is moving and eventually yep. we will get there. Yep. Uh, it's just right now you can make a case that it doesn't need to be that way. That's right. And theoretically, uh, the new Chatamo standard will give you 300 miles in 15 minutes at the new standard. And uh, right now, as you're saying, there's really no no EVs that can take <laughs> advantage of that. But, you know, it's future proof. Future, it's future proof. Future proofing. Right. Exactly. The more advancement in charging networks as well coming from the east coast of the USA. And it's interesting because it's just the other day I was thinking of, of a trip down there and I was looking at uh, the plug share app and wow, there's not a lot of DC fast charging in that neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. Then I read this article that uh, there's about a dozen states that have got together. They're teaming up to improve the charging infrastructures in those states. They're going to expand uh, DC fast charging uh, stations along the heavily traveled corridors, which makes sense. Um, and they're planning on placing these chargers every 40 to 70 miles. They've got some funding, about $108 million or so. Some of that from the Volkswagen legal settlement, settlements, some of that from the Electrify America and state utility companies funding. And the states engaged in this include Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Virginia. And that's good. You're going to you might go to Vermont soon. So oh yes. There might be more stations there. 
So uh, good news on that. And to further kind of drill down on top of that, New York State itself, which again, looking at plug share, there's not a lot of DC fast chargers, specifically in upper New York State, has announced that they're going to spend over $4 million to increase their charging infrastructure along uh, about 570 miles of throughway or highway roadways over the next two years. They want to reach 10,000 charging stations by 2021. That's, that's a massive uh, push. Uh, currently, they only have about 2,000 charging stations, and they, they plan on um, DC fast chargers, the 50 kilowatt versions, at service areas, and they also want to put level two stations at some of the commuter parking lots along the highway. So good on them. Yeah. So if you want to drive to New York, I mean, I know Tesla has superchargers. Oh yeah, there's lots in New York, but there's another option. Now Iceland, if we have any fans from Iceland, please send us a comment or an email. We'd love to hear from you. But uh, we understand that your Route One highway, which is a highway that covers about 1,300 kilometers around Iceland. Um, has implemented uh, 20 new ABB fast chargers, um, and which is significant because actually, um, Iceland, uh, sorry, Iceland has more than 6,000 electrified cars in that country. That's a lot for, a for small such country. a small little island. Absolutely. So these uh, 20 fast chargers have been installed along Route One, and um, they're ruggedized, of course, because talk about weather conditions they get up there they get it all imagine, so, yeah. so they handle those extreme weather conditions and they have this whole global management of them and uh, if something's down you phone and they they reboot it you know all that kind of stuff so pr- good on them good to see expansion in iceland electric cars are perfectly fine in the cold climates in case you're asking or you want yes, to email you, in. you've gone through a winter now, i've been through so, a winter it's mm-hmm. fine there's tons of teslas in norway it's i mean they they yeah film part of star wars there in the <laughs> empire strikes back it's pretty cold driving so the stars around in tesla yeah <laughs> that's it so speaking of tesla of course tesla hit a milestone uh, over the last couple of weeks in their supercharging network they hit uh, they exceeded ten thousand stalls and, and where the, is that ten thousand the ten thousandth one was in belleville that just opened up so that's Ooh, between toronto Canada. and um and kingston, kingston. so uh, w- mm-hmm. well needed though because yeah. kingston only has six stalls and it's a little overloaded now because of that area. So now the new one it's is, is open now. So, yeah. A lot of either driving to Ottawa or to Montreal, that corridor it gets yeah. really used. Now. Yes. You know, unless you like driving through yogurt, which is happening. But that's another story. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you saw that. oh. So that's another issue. Uh, but congrats on, on Tesla for continuing to expand their superchargers. They do have the biggest network in the world from a charging infrastructure. They've increased their stations over 50% in the past year. And that's pretty well, I mean, maybe a, a slightly short of what Elon had predicted. But it's, hey, that's a, that's a great achievement. And they continue to add more stations. And they also upgrade their stations. So they make them bigger mm-hmm. and um, with more stalls. So the current station counts, if you're tracking numbers for Tesla, North America has 583 stations. Europe has 404, and Asia Pacific has 283. So there you go. Those are stations. Those are stations. But each station stalls. has multiple stalls. Mm-hmm. So that's where uh, the they could be from. up. To, what's the largest? Is it 16 or? Oh, 50 in China. 50. That's right. I yeah, remember. Kettleman we City about is that. 40, and there's one in China that has 40. 50. Wow, that'd be massive. I mean, yeah. You know, doing the Vaughn Mills meetup last week, and there's, there's what, was it 12? There's 20 uh, there. 20 we could there. use some more. <laughs> yeah, we could have used a lot more for sure. <laughs> and, and thanks to everybody who came out for that, by yeah. the way. Um, on, on the charging technology, there's a, kind of a neat article that I that came across from this French company. Uh, it's called Gull Plug, G-U-L Plug, and they've developed a, kind of a new kind of self-plug in charging systems. So we know that there are wireless chargers out there that you can kind of you know move the car into and there's a pad, but they don't give you a, a high throughput, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of energy yeah, loss losses, in that. Yeah. This is actually still using a physical plug, and it's called uh, their product's called P-Plate. And it's 40 centimeters of a self-adjustment cable that you kind of plug into, you, you hook up to your car. It's got a magnetic a guidance type plug at the end, and it pops into the to the base that's on the floor. So the it's best way in. to explain this is similar to an Apple laptop that has the MagSafe connector, which is the mm-hmm. power connector. It's held yep. on with magnets. Yep. They designed it like that, so if you trip over it, it doesn't <laughs> send your laptop flying across the street. Yeah, um, of course, exactly. they've since discontinued it, which is a real shame, but it was a nice technology. So, so along that same idea where the plug just kind of... Yep. Kind of self-connects. Finds its way. And then, of course, it can retract back into the car when you're done. It, uh, it handles up to 7 kilowatt of charging, so 22 kilowatt in uh, three phase. And uh, no official pricing yet for this company, but apparently they've worked out some kind of a cooperation, a deal with Volvo. So you might start seeing these packaged maybe with, you know, uh, SC90s or those kind of vehicles. Yeah, it would, it would most likely be an option. It wouldn't yep. be standard on the car. It would be something right. you'd have to buy. Right. But good. You know, something a little more yeah, convenient to... Right? Uh, 
come into the garage and it kind of does its thing and off you go. I'm just waiting for the, the Tesla snakes. Though. Oh, the snake. That's right. That was, that was pretty cool. I'll put the video behind us. It's creepy. You just got to play the, the flute thing or whatever. <laughs> na, 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 na. All right. So let's get into some manufacturer updates, starting with, of course, the beloved Model 3 news. We get a lot of comments, emails, and twi uh, Twitter stuff and all kinds of things asking, when is the Model 3 coming to Europe? I mean, they're desperately waiting for this stuff. Mm. Um, and all we know is kind of what you know, folks. You know, uh, Elon has said that the Model 3 has been designed for minimal engineering and tooling changes to produce right-hand drive vehicles. It's got what he calls left-right symmetry. Think about that. Correct. Yep. And uh, I sound smart sometimes, don't I? <laughs> and the left-hand drive delivery estimates for Europe uh, and Asia are first half of 2019. But right now we're hearing the right-hand drives are second half of 2019. I know there's a lot of people that are waiting patiently. I met, met a lot of them in the UK when I was out there. Do you have anything to add to that? Any, anything more? Just huge demand. Mm -hmm. uh, Tesla seems to be focused right now on really getting to 5,000 cars a week. That's right. priority number They're one. They're close. Mm -hmm. They're really close. Um, part of it, again, uh, you know, based on evidence that we know is that they're trying to get get to that as as soon as possible just before the start of a quarter because tesla is like this close to hitting 200,000 cars in the u.s yeah. which starts to trigger the federal tax rebate mm -hmm. um or federal tax credit, credit. Uh, uh phase out mm -hmm. um so that's why they shifted a lot of deliveries through um you know the latter half of may and into june into ontario mm -hmm. because that helps us because we had a political situation going on but in the u.s what that does is that it slows down the deliveries so you know they're playing they're playing the game really is what they're doing so what they're trying to do is try to hit that 5000 um, as soon as possible so that once the, um, the 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 tax credit phase out triggers then they can just open the floodgates and then really divert a lot of uh, deliveries into the US as mm -hmm. much as possible um, Which we anticipate July to start Exactly, happening. but they're mm -hmm. not stopping there. I mean, right. Tesla did say in the past, and of course they stopped talking about uh, some kind of arbitrary date on this, but they do want to get to 10,000 cars a week. Mm -hmm. um, so th when you get to 10,000 cars, then that means that you can just open up to all the market. So I think that that's why they're saying this is kind of second half. They're kind of pushing it off in the future because they just don't have any idea as to when they're going to do this. So I would love to have the Model 3 in all over the place because it's, I mean, right now it's the number one selling small premium sedan in the U.S., actually in North America for mm -hmm. that matter. Yeah. Uh, and it's f far outclassed uh, BMWs and mm -hmm. Mercedes at this point. Yeah. So just imagine what it's going to do, when, <laughs> what it's going to do to the <laughs> European market when it finally arrives. They're going crazy. Yeah. yeah so um, especially with the base model car, because yeah. right now, the, you know, the, pre, the um, first production is fairly expensive. But mm -hmm. um, once the cheaper cars on the market, man, it's just going to be game over yep. for a lot of people. So it's going to do very well. So as we get more updates, folks, we'll continue to uh, provide uh, that information to you. Now, of course, there's been some articles, about, and we talked about this, I believe, in the last show about the Model 3 brakes and testing that's been done. So there's, there's, there's an update that was sent out. It's software OTA 2018-18- or dot 13, and it was a fix pushed out to shorten the braking distances. And I think Consumer Reports was one of the ones that had, had yeah, talked about ones, this, yeah. and they came back and said, "Yeah, it's approved." But there's a testing, there's another test by a company called AMCI in California that said, "Ah, it's good, but it's not best in class yet." So. You know, Elon's big on wanting to be best in the class on, on his products. So there'll probably be some more tweaks on that to kind of get it so. down. But it, it significantly reduced it uh, by by from the Consumer Reports test that I saw. Mm -hmm. So it was really good. And it was cool that it was done over the air. I mean, yeah. first time something like that's happened, yeah. right? So that was that's pretty cool. And again, that's part of their secret sauce and why they, why they have their value proposition. And if you want to go see a Model 3, more stores are getting them. I think it's over 30 or now, something like that, that uh, Tesla stores are receiving Model 3 so you can go sit in them and see them. No test drives yet, but that's understandably coming soon. Yeah, so, uh, I Probably think as summer. early as next month, they're going to start doing okay. uh, test drives on those cars. Uh, if you're still uh, wanting to test drive a Model 3, there's lots of them around. <laughs> Just find an owner. Yep. Most of them are pretty... Uh, Pretty accommodating if you ask them nicely. Exactly. A little bribery with some cookies sometimes goes yeah. a long way. Just in my subdivision here alone, there's five Model 3s that I've seen now, and I've met two of the owners already. So it's... There's lots around, around here. There's lots there around are, here. I mean, there are pockets mm -hmm. in the U.S. Yeah. where you still can't find one, Correct. but uh, they're popping up everywhere. They're so. popping up. But yeah, it's a great, great thought. Find, find somebody. Uh, 
Um, we also want to send our thoughts out to Yo-Yo. Um, uh, I think a lot of people have, who've been following him, and we uh, we met him in the, one of the coldest winter nights in February. Oh, man. <laughs> Shaking in a parking lot in Vaughn Mills uh, when he came out to do his road trip. But uh, he was in a crash last month in Europe, and we're glad that he's okay. We're not going to really talk about the crash. Uh, he made some really great statements about autopilot and about his usage and things like that um, i know it's being further investigated but it, it just brings to light folks that these systems are not flawless whether it's pro pilot autopilot um super you cruise. know super cruise from cadillac right yeah. cadillac yeah, and all yeah. these other systems yeah. they're they're not flawless you've got to maintain control and be aware of what's going on all the time even though it, it's easy to kind of lapse into a sense of security there so Mm -hmm. just uh, glad he's okay glad you're okay and i hope, hope you get back out on the road soon with uh, a new model 3. um interesting news now there's another study this is on the model 3 this company called second measure they do some analytics and they looked at the model 3 reservations now this is a u.s focused study only and they determined that about eight percent of those people that were waiting for a model 3 reservations have actually decided not to wait any longer and they purchased a tesla I don't. It, uh, I didn't read the full report, so I don't know if that's a CPO or a new Tesla. But they 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 purchased a Tesla product, uh, another vehicle, and 23% received a refund, uh, which is interesting. And uh, obviously, we've been talking about this. If people are looking to to get refunds and look at something else, it's mainly because of the longer waiting times for the base. You know, for that thirty-five thousand dollar base version. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're seeing some of that. Um, I'm not sure how that's weighing into new reservations. I think new reservations are probably continuing to grow. Can you get well, now that the it? car is on the market and mm -hmm. people actually see it? Um, I am yeah. seeing, I'm already seeing evidence that people are like, I'm going to buy one of those right yeah. away. So yeah. now that they're in neighborhoods, neighborhoods are actually putting down reservations. Mm -hmm. So, reservations, I do know anecdotally from mm -hmm. personal evidence that they are indeed increasing. Yeah. How many, we don't know, we don't. but but it should make up for some of the difference. So, yeah. Yeah. Just interesting. So again, there's more choice coming out of the market than there was a year or so mm -hmm. ago, two years ago. So it's all good news from that perspective. Uh, let's switch gears and talk about Kia briefly. Now, Kia uh, has, they have their, their single EV right now. They're coming out, of course, with the Nero. I am uh, yeah, the Nero. Nero right? yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what's coming. I'm trying to get because Kia and Hyundai always mix so up the models. The, it's, which one is it? The Kona or the Kona Nero? Nero. Right? Yeah, what? Somebody's going to correct Hyundai, us. Uh, Hyundai yeah. is the Kona. Kona. Nero is the Kia. There version. you go. There we got. It. We got I think it right. I got it right. <laughs> well, the Soul EV is what they have today, and uh, I, and it's a it's a nice car. It hasn't really had much updates uh, over the last few years. It's kind of been fairly stagnant, but it's been going great for sales in Europe, uh, which is interesting. It's the, actually their best selling. Um, uh, version that they sell in Europe from that perspective. So what they're going to do is end the sale of the ICE versions of those cars. Mm -hmm. uh, sometime this year, they're only going to sell the electrified version and they're going to increase the production as well to, uh, to compensate for that. Uh, in 2017, the um, the Soul EV sold, it was 12,100 models, which about 45% of them being EV, 5,400. And that number is climbing. So almost half are EVs. And Germany, being different it was the biggest market for the ev souls which is i found that stat to be kind of outstanding mm. you know i know the germans love to drive fast on the autobahn so it's, it's interesting <laughs> no word on whether this is going to happen uh in other markets but uh it's interesting to see that shift there here's a manufacturer we haven't talked at all about no. in any of these shows maserati and um they're of course owned by F the fiat chrysler or fca they have announced that uh, they're coming out with 12 plug-in models uh, till, and these will be coming out from, from the next couple of years to 2022. And four of those will be all electric battery only versions. Um, there's a model called the Alfieri, and it'll be offered as a pure electric model in both a coupe and convertible form, uh, with, which will have three motor all wheel drive, 800 volt battery technologies. And another big step is that they're going to abandon diesels in the next four years. That's really aggressive for them to do that. So, And that's surprising coming from Fiat because they've been essentially silent on the whole electrification. That's right. Other than the... Um, Pacifica. The, uh, Pac uh, well, Pacifica, in North America, we have the Pacifica. And then the, um, the Chrysler. Uh, the 500E, I think they have. It, yeah, well, that one, though, has always been very on. controversial because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the president has always said that they lose, like, crazy amount of money That's on right. that car. but uh, Which is a shame because it's actually a fun car to drive. Yeah, pretty zippy. <laughs> so, well, good on, good on you know, uh, Maserati and uh, Fiat um, Chrysler to get into that game. So if you've got a lot of money and they're not cheap cars, stay tuned and see what, the, what they come out with their models. 
Uh, Nissan, now Nissan has come out and announced a software fix for the 2016 to 2017 30 kilowatt hour LEAF versions. There's been some reports of early, early battery degradation in some of those models. It's been a very limited number. I don't have specs on how many, but remember folks, there are like 320,000 LEAFs out there and they, they continue to sell. So it'll be a small number of some sort. And, and really this software fix is to address the inaccurate battery range and state of charge reporting. So it seems that a lot of those reports of early degradation, that isn't really nothing wrong with the batteries. It's just the software that's uh, computing algorithm. that yeah. algorithms are yeah. wrong in right. that. So um, some, order, some owners have experienced that they're losing you know, range faster and, and capacity. Like over a year, they've lost maybe 10% or 20%, which is pretty, pretty crazy. So um, some packs were replaced under warranty, of course. Nissan has their eight-year warranty, at least here in North America, but the majority of issues were determined to be that software issue. So they're doing, I believe, in-dealer. They'll send you a letter or, or tell you to come into the dealership and reprogram the controller so that you get the accurate displays. And this is open for all the 2016 and 2017 Leafs service campaign. So phone your dealer if you're concerned about that. And of course, it doesn't impact the warranty of the batteries at all. Still all remains in effect. No, oh, good. So good on Nissan to recognize I'm that. I'm seeing a lot more, especially the 2018 Leaf. Now I'm seeing them everywhere. They're doing really well. They here. are. Yeah. Well, they're, they can't keep up with demand here, my understanding. <laughs> Apparently they're sold out in Canada. I'm, that's what I heard. And somebody asked me, is that for sure? I said, well, that's what I've heard. And mm. nobody's corrected well, me. So it's a good problem to have, I guess. Good problem to have. They're taking orders Except now for the people for that want to buy them right now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Now, Renault, of course, they're part of the Nissan Mitsubishi Alliance. Uh, they're in that group. Now, Renault is, uh, I mentioned in my fully charged live report that I've been driving around in the Zoe, and I, I featured that on the show as well. It's a great car. It's, it's probably their most popular, um, one of the most popular EVs in Europe. And uh, they want to invest, Renault wants to invest over a billion euro in the next few years to, to accelerate development and production of these cars in France. They're all built in France. They want to add a second production site. They want to double the Zoe production. Uh, right now, the Zoe has just under 24% of the EU market share, which is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. They want to triple, they, they build their own motors as well, and want to triple electric motor production. They also want to further the investments in the Kangoo uh, ZE, which I, excuse me, I showed on the fully large show, um, which is a pretty cool uh, EV as well. And they uh, also can going to continue product development by introducing eight all-electric and 12 electrified cars by 2022. So we've got 2020 to look forward to, and now 2022 seems to be a pattern <laughs> arising. I think VW is also claiming 2022, so mm -hmm. we'll have to see. But again, the, the new models uh, are all based on a joint platform from that Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi alliance. So cool. Yeah, Renault's done quite well. It's too bad that they're, they're not over here. That car would do really well here. Yeah, well, I think... Uh... Yeah, we used to have Renault back in the I 70s. I know we did. I remember, yeah. Maybe early 80s. Used to duct tape a few. No, I <laughs> no, no, they were all right. <laughs> they were okay. And Peugeot, remember Peugeot? Oh, yes, another of course. One. They were fun. So in some other news, uh, there's an article that came out that Zipcar, which is, of course, is a car sharing network, and they're all over the place. Um, in, the, in London, the UK, they added 325 new electric cars recently to their fleet in that city or actually they're going to add them by the end of the year i think they're starting with a couple of hundred in the next month or so and scale that out um it'll be the largest pool of electric car sharing uh that you can find in the uk and guess what kind of cars that they're adding <laughs> i what don't can know you get? they're adding all vw eagles well that's where they all went that's where they all went Yep. Sorry to my wife. <laughs> yeah, She's I the know. one that wanted an e-golf. So there you go. That's where they are. <laughs> so London, UK, grabbed them all, apparently, because there's none here in Canada. None, or very none few. to be had. None to be had. But good news for that. And I think we're seeing more of these car sharing services adopt EVs um, and move away from the ICE. You know, lower maintenance. Um, Uber's all that next. Stuff. Uber. Uh, yeah, all these about yeah, that. They're all adopting the, the EVs now. Exactly. And our last story for today is uh, one of the things I, I saw over in uh, the Fully Charged Live event was Nissan had a big booth on their X storage product. And a lot of people here in North America are probably not familiar, but it's very similar to Tesla's Powerwall, where you can in, you can purchase solar and home energy storage solutions. Uh, and Nissan does sell some of the storage or the solar applications as well, or they partner, I believe. 
Um, these storage solutions are available in both 4.2 kilowatt hour and 6 kilowatt hour versions. I don't know what the power walls, but I'm sure it's 14 kilowatt. 14, okay, so uh, a little bit bigger. And the batteries, you can you can either buy these um, X storage uh, boxes with new batteries, or they can be through repurposed uh, used batteries from a leaf, mm. which is great to see this kind of reuse because I know there's still a lot of discussion about recycling of, of batteries and things. It's like a common that. question that I get when people mm -hmm. are asking me, like, what happens when the batteries dead well the battery actually doesn't become dead i think most of the manufacturers really estimate that the useful life of battery is when it can hold say 75 to 80 percent of a charge at that point the batteries can be completely recycled so the modules can be removed mm -hmm. and repurposed for things like storage because look you're not powering a car with it it's just a buffer mm -hmm. uh the, these things are not going to go into a landfill they can be repurposed so that's why we're seeing some of these uh, products coming on the market now that that use recycled batteries mm -hmm. and stuff of course uh, as long as you can get a discount on it because yep. nobody wants to pay full price exactly. for a used battery exactly right? and these has been been you know again kind of under the radar here in north america but big in 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 such a asia pacific but in europe with their vehicle to home vehicle to grid technologies and they're going to continue to, to push on that so good to see and you can get these packages uh, i think in the uk right now from around ten thousand usd and up and that's uh, storage and solar combined so oh that's good that's pretty good pricing when you think about it so mm -hmm. good for them and we have some quick video here on our uh, Georgian College event. I took some video of, uh, during that event, um, interviewed a couple of people. So uh, have a look. Hopefully you'll get inspired. Here's that video. Hello, folks. I'm here in uh, Georgian College in Barrie, Ontario for a show and shine show. It's actually a manufacturer show along with a lot of private cars, both exotic sports cars, uh, custom mods, and all kinds of different cars. And of course, being with the modern times that Georgian College is, they want a bunch of EVs here. So I'm here with my uh, new Leaf, uh, shining it up and uh, be showing it off along with uh, a lot of Teslas which are here. Uh, this whole line, as you can see, is going to be full of mainly Teslas, I think, uh, from this, this perspective. Uh, maybe another Leaf might show up, who knows? Uh, maybe uh, something else. Uh, we're actually here next to the plug and drive booth which is over here and they're going to be doing some ride-alongs today but certainly go visit plug and drive because they have a lot of cars they don't sell cars there they just give you the EV, EV knowledge and experience and let you test drive cars from multiple vendors so should be an interesting show uh, Trev's coming up as well he should be here shortly so uh, we'll get back to you So I'm here with Caleb. He's a student here at Georgian College and he's one of the volunteers that's helping the plug and drive guys today. Just wanted to ask Caleb a couple questions just to get an idea of what the uh, program that they have here at Georgian College. So uh, hi Caleb, thanks for talking nice to me. Nice meeting you. Yeah. Um, so at Georgian College we actually have two programs. Mm -hmm. One is a diploma and one is a degree program okay. that's an honors, yep. uh, honors Bachelor of Business Administration. Okay. Um, and so I'm in the four year yeah, and great. a lot of it we talk about the business aspect of the automotive industry. Okay. Yep. Um, for instance, we also learn about the anatomy of combustible engines, yep. but we also touch base on a little Which, bit. Which you know are going to be going away, but way in the future. You yeah, know, that's way, way out there. Way in the but, future. I always you know, say it's still yeah. a generation maybe. Yeah. So One of our classes we actually talk about the whole industry of how it started with Ford okay. and stuff. Yep. yep. And like I always like to say to people, history always repeats itself. So when everyone wasn't able to afford a brand new uh, car yep. that was combustible, yep. right? only people with a lot of money could afford that. But now yep. when Ford came, he was able to make it accessible yep. to, to the whole market. Yep. And that's what is, is exactly going to happen to the EV vehicles. Well. So and more and more vendors as you guys have here, have lots of cars that you'll be uh, test driving for folks today. Yeah. Now, what do you guys do learn anything in, from an electric vehicle uh, perspective in any of your programming or in the course um, curriculum? Not too much because our, our curriculum is mostly based off traditional combustion okay. engines. Yeah. <laughs> but they are trying to incorporate more of the anatomy of a EV vehicle. Right. So Great. how the battery works, okay. its composition, etc. Excellent. Good. Well, congrats. And what year are you are you on the on the um, four-year program? Second. Second year. Second year. All right. Well, all the best to your program. Thank you. Thank you very much for volunteering. Yeah, it actually makes your schools feel like yeah. do be your old Trev. Keep talking. <laughs> hey everybody. Hey everyone. <laughs>
Well, folks, it's been a warm day here at Georgian College in Barrie, and I'm here with Emil and Terry from Plug and Drive. Well, you've seen Emil before on our show on camera. Guys, uh, it's been a good day. We've had a lot of people come out. I wanted to ask what's kind of the most common question that you guys were asked today from uh, people looking at EVs? Oh, today I think is uh, what can I drive? So there are a lot of cars available now that people aren't, uh, aren't expecting to be available, like a full-size SUV mm -hmm. in the Mitsubishi Outlander there. And uh, they just want to get the experience now. And yeah. They have a variety of cars to choose from, so it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to come out to the... Absolutely. Test Terry, your thoughts? Yeah, and this is a common question, not just here, but we hear it all the time, is range. Range is an issue with these cars, unlike gasoline-only powered cars, uh, because gasoline is so readily available on your typical trips. There's a management issue, so there's questions around which car is best for me? Again, we go back to more about the car, but yep. we talk to the drivers about their driving profile, their driving, daily yeah, driving nice. habits, and which car works for them may be quite different than the, the next person who uh, approaches us because their patterns are different. So there's no one answer to these things. Yeah, I think that's a key point. There is a, really no one answer, and as, of course, more products hit the, the streets and more selection, more varieties, it's all good for the consumer. So uh, if you're talking to people, make sure you let them know what's out there and some of your thoughts and uh, be knowledgeable and get people to, to research. And again, it has to fit what's in their daily lifestyle with their needs. You know, a plug might not be for everybody. So uh, encourage the adoption in whichever way you can. So thanks, guys, for a great day. Thanks for inviting Absolutely. me out. Thanks for coming. And we'll see you next time. Right. Peace, everybody. Thank you. Well, hope you enjoyed that video. It was a lot of fun. And uh, again, we encourage you to get out there, get involved with any local associations, clubs, whatever whatever tickles your fancy and, and help promote EV adoption by educating because that's the number one deterrent, I think right now, is people just don't know. There's a lot of people uh, that I talk to all the time that have no idea that there's currently an incentive program in Ontario. They go, what? You know, some money off a car? Are you kidding me? So it's stuff like that that get people engaged. That's you you right. see that all the time. Yeah, yeah. People need to get their hands on these things. Mm -hmm. They need to touch them, feel them, and realize that these aren't unicorns. These things actually do exist. And you can save some significant money if yeah. if you're in an area where uh, fuel is expensive. And it's so, climbing yeah. here. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, you know, some of the cities like Toronto has a, a plug and drive, which in, uh, in the UK, in uh, Milton Keynes, Keynes, they have uh, the EV Experience Center, so similar experience. We can go out and test drive all kinds of different cars. They don't sell anything. So, yeah. And these things are popping up everywhere. So just get involved. That's the main thing. And that's really it for the show. Uh, for this time, we, there was a lot of information we covered, things to catch <laughs> up on. Of course, uh, please send us emails, comments to our email, which is evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter. The handle is at EVRevShow. That's E-V-R-E-V -E Show. Don't forget to uh, like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel because that builds up the user base, allows us mm -hmm. to keep going and uh, bring us more videos. Uh, Ken, why don't you tell them about our, uh, our new yeah. Patreon? So we just launched a new Patreon campaign for the EV Revolution Show, and you can uh, find that at uh, www.patreon.com backslash EV Revolution Show. Check it out there. Uh, as we've been saying uh, for, for our Patreon subscribers, uh, it's much appreciated. Um, a lot of the stuff that we do, we continue to upgrade tech. We, we you know, we're traveling a bit more. We're getting, you know, access to, to more stuff as we go, both from the Model Three uh, Owners Club side and the EV Revolution show that we're we're both involved with. Um, Trevor's kind of taking a little bit more ownership now on the Model 3 stuff and focusing on that. And I'm going to take a little bit more ownership on trying to, to drive the direction of EV Show and, and jointly continue to uh, to do those for both of us. Uh, it is opening up doors, which is great. You know, yeah. we're, we're looking at doing some more traveling, um, you know, doing more car reviews, this big kind plans, of stuff. Big plans, big so, plans. Big plans. So any of this Patreon stuff from, from either side helps us uh, immensely. And we appreciate it a lot, anything that you can do there. So... Uh, that's the pitch on that. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that's really it for the show. Any closing remarks? No, anything? that's about it. Uh, yeah. We don't know what we're going to do for vacation time if we take some mm, time off, whatever. But uh, yeah. yeah, my calendar is getting pretty full as Guess far I better as think about that. Other, other things that are coming on. So uh, <laughs> if anything changes, just uh, make sure you follow us on Twitter and stuff. We'll, we'll give you updates on that. So anyways, Please that's do. it for this show. Yep. And we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for All watching, right. folks. Take care. Peace. See you later.